Today on Airborne, the FAA certifies Robinson's new police helicopter. Eclipse adds anti-skid brakes to the Eclipse 550 jet. And the Senate passes the EU ETS exclusion bill. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to the Friday edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. The FAA has certified the Robinson R66 turbine police helicopter. The R66 police model is specially configured for law enforcement and meets the latest FAA crashworthiness regulations. The four-place R66 police helicopter combines R66 power, altitude performance, and capacity with the latest in surveillance systems. Turnkey ready, the R66 police comes standard with FAA-approved technology including the FLIR Ultra 8000 thermal imaging camera, a 10-inch fold-down color monitor, the new Spectrolab SX7 searchlight with 30 million candle power, and a dual audio controller. Performance specifications of the R66 police helicopter include a cruise speed of up to 120 knots, payload of 800 pounds with full fuel, and a hover ceiling out of ground effect at max gross weight of 10,000 feet. The first production R66 police helicopter has a price tag of $1,104,000, and it will be delivered in October to Southern California's Fontana Police Department. It's used Robinson's R44 police helicopter since 2005. Robinson will continue expanding the R66 line with an electronic news gathering version and a float version, both targeted for release in 2013. Eclipse Aerospace has formally announced the addition of a new anti-skid braking system available as an option on the new production Eclipse 550 jets and to be offered as a retrofit to the existing fleet. ABS allows for maximum braking energy and skid control without the need for a conventional hydraulic system which is unique to the Eclipse jet. The new system will include two brake control valves installed in each wheel well, two axle-mounted wheel speed sensors, a computer, and a software update to the Avio Processing Center software. The company says the technology will add yet another level of safety to the Eclipse jet. An aircraft testing is complete with certification, and availability is expected within six months. The U.S. Senate has passed Senate Bill 1956, which would allow the Transportation Secretary to direct U.S. airlines to not participate in the European Union's emissions trading scheme because it violates international law and U.S. sovereignty. The move was lauded by industry groups, including Airlines for America. The U.S. House previously passed a similar bill. A4A President and CEO Nicholas E. Calillo said, quote, Congress has spoken. U.S. airlines should not be subjected to this illegal scheme that amounts to little more than a cash grab for the European Union, as none of the funds collected are required to be used for environmental purposes. You're watching Airborne. In a moment, United Airlines gets its first 787. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. 
Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Boeing and United Airlines announced the delivery of the airliner's first 787 Dreamliner on Monday. United is the first airline in North America to take delivery of the 787. Jeff Smithick, president and CEO of United, said, quote, As a North American launch customer, we are delighted to be getting our first 787 Dreamliner. As we continue to build the world's leading airline, we are excited for our customers and coworkers to experience this game-changing aircraft. This delivery marks the first of 50 Dreamliners that United has on order. United's first Dreamliner is expected to arrive in Houston later this week to begin a month-long training and certification program, including non-commercial flights to each of United's domestic hubs. On Tuesday, Boeing celebrated the one-year anniversary of its very first 787. That Dreamliner went to ANA in Japan. Since then, Boeing has delivered 25 Dreamliners to six different customers. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden announced three changes to his senior leadership team on Tuesday. Robert Lightfoot, acting associate administrator at NASA headquarters in Washington, will assume that role on a permanent basis. Patrick Schuerman, director of NASA's John C. Stennis Space Center near Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, will become director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Schuerman's successor as the Stennis director is Dr. Richard J. Gilbrick, who currently serves as that center's deputy director. All three management changes are effective immediately. Lightfoot is the agency's highest ranking civil servant, responsible for oversight and integration of NASA's broad efforts in human spaceflight, science, and aeronautics. Schuerman has provided executive leadership, overall direction, and management of Stennis since being named that center's director in 2010. He's responsible for implementing NASA's mission in the area of rocket propulsion testing and developing and maintaining NASA's world-class rocket propulsion test facilities. Gilbrick has served as Stennis' deputy director since 2010. He began his NASA career in 1991 at Stennis in the area of propulsion test technology. It's no secret that American Airlines is canceling large numbers of flights, either because of an alleged pilot sick out or the pilots reported serious mechanical issues. Fort Worth, Texas TV station KXAS reported Sunday night that American had canceled 400 flights last week. Now the consumer watchdog group FlyersRights.org is urging consumers to either book away from American or to use their accumulated frequent flyer miles now rather than risk losing them should the airline collapse in bankruptcy. Kate Haney, CEO of FlyersRights.org, says, quote, American Airlines is simply referring their customers affected by these flight cancellations to their contract of carriage. Why? Because their contract of carriage states all they get is a refund. Haney says that means the customers are damaged and that they will have to repurchase tickets at usually far more expensive same-day prices or cancel their trips and often lose non-refundable deposits. Six balloon teams representing three nations and featuring some of the world's greatest gas balloonists are preparing to compete in the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta's America's Challenge Race for Gas Balloonist. Four of the six competing teams include at least one member who has previously won the America's Challenge. And for the first time in its history, the race will also include a Russian team of aeronauts. The object of the America's Challenge, set for launch weather permitting on Saturday, October 6th, is to fly the greatest distance from Albuquerque 
while competing within the event rules. The balloonists often stay aloft more than two days and must use the winds aloft and weather systems to their best advantage to gain the greatest distance. Flights of more than 1,000 miles are not unusual, and the winners sometimes travel as far as Canada and the U.S. East Coast. ANN's Glenn Moyer will be on hand at the Balloon Fiesta and will provide updates on his daily aerocast as well as here on Airborne. It's Friday and time for our barnstorming commentary. This week, Jim opines about transparency, honesty, focus, and what he expects from an aero association. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, folks. We're having a real interesting week here at ANNHQ with quite a few communications and quite a few tips and rumors coming in from a number of sources involving the latest goings on at first at AOPA and some at EAA and a few of the other associations. And what it really comes down to is there are a number of associations that seem to be interested in expanding their mission, but the problem is, is we're raising serious questions right now about who might get hurt in the process and more important, why these roles should be taken on. Now, by the time you see this, we may have some of these stories out there. But before we wanted to get into all that, I wanted to talk about something I think is important to put out there in regards to our associations and in regards to the people who supposedly represent the best interests of aviation. I'd like to propose a three plus one rule. Transparency, honesty, and focus, and then accountability. One, out of our associations and our representative organizations and the folks who represent us, we need transparency. We do not need to hear, as I've heard in the last 48 hours, we'll tell you when we want you to know. Sorry if you represent us, and if you're looking at our best interest, we should be a part of it no matter what, even in the very earliest stages. Two, we need honesty. No fabrications, no nonsense. Just tell us what's going on. Don't sugarcoat it. Give us the honest facts. Three, we need to focus. Now, focus is a double-edged sword. We not only need to focus, but we have to figure out what we need to focus on. We've got an AOPA right now. It's deciding it's becoming AOPA Incorporated. Uh, there are people who were or have been and may still be their constituent members and companies who are finding themselves in a position to compete with AOPA, where AOPA is harming them or competing with them if for reasons that, frankly, just baffle us all. But most important, the other missions that we would associate with an AOPA, why are all these TFRs going on? Well, who's representing us on the Hill? So determine the mission, determine the proper mission, focus, focus, focus. And finally, accountability. Let me be very clear about something. Nobody in aviation should support any representative, any member organization that won't be accountable to the folks that are paying the bills and providing the resources necessary for those organizations to take to you know take on these roles. In other words, if you're not voting for the board of directors, if you're not voting for the president, if you don't have a decision uh, process whereby the actual members of the association have serious power in determining the future of the organization, then you need to go elsewhere. Real simple, three plus one, transparency, honesty, focus, and on the right things, by the way, and accountability. If not, let's take our membership elsewhere. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course, Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell, and boy, am I in trouble now. Finally, today on Airborne, you know the old saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This can be an especially troublesome situation if one finds himself or herself in space. So NASA sometimes goes the extra mile to ensure the crews on the ISS get some playtime. Such will be the case on October 13th when the Expedition 33 crew will screen the classic 1956 science fiction movie, The Forbidden Planet. And in the best sci-fi cliche, they will not be alone. The movie, which marked the debut of Robbie the Robot, will also be screened for the public at the Kennedy Space Center. American astronaut Sunita Williams will even provide an introduction 
live from the ISS. The screening is sponsored by Turner Classic Movies and kicks off a series of movies to be shown around the country leading up to its TCM Classic Film Festival in April of next year. However, it's not the first time station crews have settled in for a good flick. Movies are frequently shown on the station as part of the astronauts' psych support as a means of keeping them happy. I wonder though, how does one make popcorn in space? That's our program for Friday, September 28th. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're airborne with Aero TV. I am Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday with another edition of Airborne.